we're talking about changing corporate culture in D&I, so let's start with an easy one. Uh, I, I'm hoping it's an easy one, actually. Do you think a CEO, the executives, or and or a DNI chiefs and their values shapes and defines a corporate culture? And if, if so, do you think that unless most of the employees share the same values, that firms can't really create a single enterprise-wide culture? Uh, Olivia, let's start with you. Okay, great. Wow. Um, yeah, I think... For, I think for CEO and also for um, you know people that are leading diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think certainly they are role models. I don't know whether in terms of you know they will shape the entire corporate cultures around that, but certainly they, they need to lead from the front. Um, I think often you know for uh, a lot of organizations, you know, as we're looking at it, why you know in terms of DNI strategy sometimes doesn't always work is because we don't actually have someone from the top leading it and really championing and believing in it. And so I think that absolutely is critical. But I think at the same time is that the reality is that we're human beings. You're not going to get everybody on board. I mean not everybody's going to agree, you know, to, you know, not, you know, let alone a DNI strategy, even a business strategy. Not everybody's going to agree to it. And I think what you need to do is to get majority of the people on board or and, you know, and able to define, you know, who your champions are is going to be pushing and constantly reminding people the importance of DNI within the organizations. And then at the same time, in the meanwhile, trying to convince those, the rest of them that are sort of sitting on a fence and wondering that at least to get them not to oppose to the entire concept and realizing how important it is to them as an individual, uh, you know, let alone not only for the organization, but as for them as an individual, why this is important to them as well. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I would see how that plays out. Thank you. I love that you need a corporate champion, you need to lead from the top. But Jarvis, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I tend to agree. The executive leadership team plays such a critical role at establishing and representing a lot of what those values are and what they include. For us at Nike, it's centering around a mission-centric approach, our focus on serving athletes and creating inspiration and innovation within all athletes. And paired with that, though, we recognize that grassroots activism really helps us to localize a lot of the work. This is the role that Nike United and Converse United, which is our internal employee resource groups, they play that role in helping us to understand what are both the macro, social, economic, and political components, as well as those that are micro-impacting to Nike that we should be elevating around topics of discussion. And so you enter a framework where the top-down approach of that model behavior that Olivia described, and then the bottoms-up approach through grassroots engagement is there. The group that's often neglected, though, that plays such a critical role in the driving establishment and responsibility of corporate culture as people managers. Corporate culture is only as successful as the experience that's created from it. And we recognize that it's the individual people managers and hiring managers that help to shape that. And so how we drive deeper connectivity and continuity middle out is even more important to ensure that there is alignment to our goals and maxims and that those leaders themselves are also a part of this great fabric of defining the culture. I love that, Jarvis. And I think that that top-down, bottom-up approach is, is integral um, to being able to build a culture that resonates and makes sense for all. Um, which brings me to my second question, actually. What are the challenges of creating a corporate culture in a global organisation to be inclusive and representative of all locations and cultural nuances in which they operate? Nike being a global company, John Swire being uh, headquartered in Hong Kong, but also a glo global company. I'm going to switch it around and go to you, Jarvis, first. Yeah, you know, at Nike, we don't see it so much as a challenge, but rather an opportunity. Part of the work is when you are a U.S.-based company, you have to be so deeply conscious of the fact that equity means understanding and meeting communities where they are to define their starting point. And what that means is we have to move from a space purely of translation, where you develop a strategy here in the United States and then position it in Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, Japanese, et cetera, and rather move toward localization where you understand the cultural nuances, which means the history and sociology of how this work comes to life in those regions. I'm proud, for example, of a lot of the work that we've done at Nike Connected here. Take, for example, our Black community commitment, where following the murder of George Floyd, we committed between Nike, Michael Jordan, and the Jordan brand $140 million in support of the Black community. But when we look at the global landscape of this work, we understand that experiences in Blackness and global Blackness are so tantamount 
to consider in spaces like the UK, France, South Africa, et cetera. And so we recently expanded our Black community commitment through our work in London on how we communicate with the Black community and drive education, economic empowerment, as well as a focus on social and racial justice. In addition to work that we continue in the greater China marketplace, as we look to assess how do we operationalize the work of understanding the work that's happening in various regions around the world have to be viewed as engaged, consistent, and aligned to how we're thinking in other GEOs as well. Thank you. And Olivia, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think you got to look at, especially if you are an organization that operates globally, uh, that you've got to think about not only from where your headquarter is. Um, and so I, I think for us, you know, because we are, you know, in some ways our parent parent companies, you know, is in the UK. So we started out, of, you know, and out of the United Kingdom. But then, you know, we've been in Hong Kong for over 150 years. And so, you know, our headquarters now is here and we spread and worked around the world. You know, APAC is, of course, one of our, in terms of the largest region, but we also have, you know, companies that reach out in, you know, that works in the US, in Australia, um, you know, and in Europe as well. So I think one of the things that we have learned, uh, you know, in terms of working here is that because also the way that we operate is that we are quite autonomous. We are in a conglomerate. So we have businesses that are of very different industry and operating very different geography. Often we said that at the end of the day, we must respect our business lead. We must respect the CEO that's operating each of these operating company that they know their organizations and the geography and the industry they operate the best. And so then while, of course, you know, it is important that you need to have a consistent policies, especially around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, that provides a guideline. But what we then do is that we actually will have conversations with each of the individual operating companies, with their DNI committees, and asking them, well, what does it actually mean for you? You know, so, you know, for example, when Black Lives Matter came, and, you know, at the end of the day, of course, for our operations in the U.S., they completely get it, and all of them, they know exactly what they need to do. But then when we have this conversation in Asia or, for example, in Hong Kong in the headquarter, we ask, well, what does it actually mean to you? I, I think initially some of them would think, oh, well, we don't quite understand because, you know, we don't have a black community in Hong Kong. Then we start to say, OK, wait a minute. So if you put aside not about the black community, but it's about an underrepresented racial group. Who is underrepresented, you know, in terms of a, as a racial group in Hong Kong? They would start to think about our ethnic minorities, uh, colleagues, those that are from South Asia, for example, uh, those are from uh, Southeast Asia, you know, within the Asia, you know, in the Asia region, and say, okay, well, that actually, in many ways, has the same application. So I think for us, you know, that the way we see it is that, you know, when you look at these examples, how do you apply them? into the local geographies and the local industry that you operate in. How would it, you know, how do you explain it so it makes sense to them? So then they say, okay, well, for this particular one, it's not so much about a, you know, black or African-American issue. It is about underrepresented racial group. And what is, what is the underrepresented racial group for us here? And what it is that we need to do about it? So, you know, I think in, in that sense, it's really always asking those questions and thinking about applications. Yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, Olivia. Sorry, I, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I agree with Olivia's sentiments. You know, as commerce and corporate continue to expand, there's an expectation of generations and how we think about globalization and multiculturalism. And so it becomes a consumer expectation that much more. And it was exactly what Olivia described. It's finding that empathy within the topic or subject matter. And that's what carries us forward, even if it's not our own lived experience day to day. And we, we found that to be truly helpful on developing truly global strategies. I love that. And you both touched on Black Lives Matter, George Floyd. Let me just turn our attention to this moment on time, uh, this moment of social justice. Uh, do you think the business case for change is still relevant or needed, or should we just all get on with it? <laughs> Either one of you. Uh well, I mean, maybe I can start with like, you know, where I suppose Alicia and I are both closer to home is, say, in Hong Kong, for example, we are in the midst of the fifth wave of um, the, uh, the virus. And so, you know, while everybody else around the world seems to be opening up, we are now actually shutting down. And so, you know, in some ways, if you think about it, well, you know, like, oh, companies, they are thinking about survival. What is it about social justice? But if you really think about it, it is about social justice. Why? Because who is going to be impacted the most are those that actually least can afford to be impacted. For those that are for women that are single mothers, for women that are actually working, you know, three part-time jobs to raise a family, 
for the elderly that has nobody just to look after them, you know, because, you know, either their children are actually, you know, working somewhere else or they're also working, you know, or for, you know, or for lower income families. For those that in Hong Kong we call living in subdivided flats where you have, you know, 15 people living in a 200 square feet place, you know. And so, you know, these are the kind of things that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you realize that, well, actually, it means even more today because the question is that, well, what it is that we're going to do about it? You know, why Why would, you know, whatever disaster like this, whether it's man-made or natural, why it is always those that are the least can afford to be impacted are the one that's most of most affected. How is it not possible that foreign organizations look at these and say, well, you know, social justice absolutely is a critical thing for an organization to look at because why? We we are in this community. We are actually, you know, some of us, you know, many of the big MNC working in, in the community, we are the biggest employer. We have a responsibilities. So, you know, I would actually argue that, you know, in times like this, it is even more important that organizations actually really look at what is their responsibilities to the community. Yeah, I could not agree more, Olivia. Uh, with the advent of the pandemic, it forced these conversations of social and racial justice into our own homes, as many of us had to navigate what experiences in working from home look like. These topics are relevant more now than ever. As Olivia described, it is the most marginalized amongst us that continue to face the brunt of the impact. Take, for example, just last year, today, in the United States, in Atlanta, Georgia, to be exact, eight individuals were murdered in a senseless act of racial brutality. And yet, the hashtag, hashtag Stop Asian Hate, continued to trend, resulting in increased visibility for Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And yet, even today, over the last six weeks, we see the names of individuals like Christina Yuna Lee in New York City, who continue to face suffering and impact around while the growth of visibility is proving impactful on representation, it, there still is impact. While Black Lives Matter as a movement spurred global endeavors and catalyzed work around corporate engagement, Black transgender women in cities like New York, Atlanta, Dallas, DC, and Houston are continuing to be murdered on an annual basis at near epidemic levels. Uh, resulting in an opportunity for corporations to leverage our voice to understand experiences of these communities, build trust and empathy at the core of what we do, and use our voices and platforms to elevate and navigate these conversations. It's far too easy to view them as isolated incidences that only happen within our own borders and our own spaces. But the sad reality is as we watch visuals and images play on, for example, of, of the calamity associated with refugee engagement right now in the Ukraine, it harkens back to experiences of many in our Middle Eastern and Northern African communities who have either themselves as first generation or second generation experiences understand that refugee experience and want to be connected and committed and want our corporations to use our voice, not only in the extension of financial support and help, engagement with volunteerism, but actually leveraging the power of a vocal platform to make real change. And so George Floyd's murder had an opportunity to spur impact and interest, but the work is just getting started. I agree with you. And I love that you said the work is just getting started. Now, you both touched on the responsibility and the expectation that the communities have uh, on enterprises to do the right thing and to continue to do the work. But how committed do you think organizations are to DNI and to the work? Uh, because progress, let's be honest, continues to be slow and for most of us, frustrating. Um, so how have we really have we really actually moved from the ticker box exercise to real intention, or is there a long way to go? Jarvis, let's start with you. You know, I think there's been a shift in philosophy for sure. When we look at the history of DEI programs in corporate, it, we move from spaces of affirmative action to the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion by McKinsey and Company, Deloitte, and others. Where I think we are now, though, is the need to outline the business case for breaking barriers and dismantling stereotypes and tropes. We're in a space now where our overt understanding of how these bodies of work and how these phobias and isms, if you will, show up in the workplace have now moved into more covert spaces where microaggressive behavior becomes the course of the day. And so for us to truly start to position resolves is gonna necessitate that we look at ways in which we're breaking barriers systemically. We have to move beyond just the development of a new program and initiative, which certainly serves such a critical role in the work that we do, but start to actually evaluate things like our talent processes, 
and understand where biases may enter in recruitment and promotion and retention as a means to drive representation. Understanding, are we actually connecting diversity, equity, and inclusion into our business operations and our systems? At Nike, we do this by assessing impact on consumer, our elite athletes, our everyday athletes, and of course, our employees, with the goal to drive concurrence within that experience. We do this by focusing on and obsessing how equity and inclusion shows up in brand marketing, within our products, and of course, within our team and talent strategies. By navigating this deeply matrixed approach, though, we're able to outline and understand not only is there a business case for breaking barriers, but by creating an opening for entryway of sport for all people, we can have a reverberating impact to how this is consumed by our employees who are indeed our consumers, by our consumers, many of whom desire to be our employees. It's, it's great to hear what Job is saying because, you know, clearly this is a journey and, you know, he talked about starting from philosophies and now moving on to the people and to the customers. I think for many of us in Asia, uh, d and I is a new, relatively newer topic. I suppose the good thing is that we have a lot of examples to look for, right? You know, we've seen what's happening in the U.S., you know, in large MNCs, you know, like large companies like Nike. You know, we see it, you know, in the U.K., you know, at the big, you know, like the McKenzie and the Deloitte has been doing a lot of these type of studies. So I think it's great. So I think from our perspective at the end is that, you know, of course we want to run, but we have to realize that, you know, you need to learn how to walk before you can run. So sometimes, you know, you talk to Alicia, you ask about box, tech, you know, taking exercise and, you know, whether this is something that's really ingrained. You know, I would say that at the end of the day, you know, yes, you, you need that, you know, as we said, you need the top, the role models, you know, the, the, the senior leaders to believe in this. But sometimes, you know what, box checking exercise is not all bad because that's kind of how it gets started. Because at least, you know, it's almost like a checklist. You force people to say, well, this is an action plan. This is what you have to do. It's kind of like, you know, you're making, you know, you have revenue targets that you have to meet. You know, you have a plan that you have to follow as well, right? So it's exactly the same way. So you know what I would sometimes say is that if people are start off thinking about, oh God, you know, it's one more thing I have to do, is a box checking exercise, I have to do it, well, let them do it because at least they'll do it. And then hopefully in the process, you get them to start thinking about, you know what, actually, now that I've done it, I've realized that you know, this is the right thing to do. It's not only right, you know, for me as a person, so especially for people that have children and family thinking about, yeah, what I want, you know, my, my daughter or what I want, you know, my niece or my nephews to have to go through the same kind of challenge, you know, as what my parents or my grandparents are going through. And so I think, you know, this is actually a really great start. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, but I suppose a good thing is that in Asia, because we have sort of, you know, now really starting to really get in, into it, we can also learn a lot, you know, from the example, from what we have seen in other companies, you know, that are much more advanced and say, okay, what are the lessons that, you know, that we can learn from them? Can we then maybe take a shortcut can we then do it in a way that, you know, maybe that we don't make the same mistake so that we can actually move faster? So maybe instead of, you know, like, uh, you know, instead of a, you know, they're running a triple marathon, can we complete it in two marathons? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, only, only 84 kilometers, <laughs> not, 40, you know, not 120, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think, you know, absolutely. I mean, it, it is there. We have to believe that, you know, it's happening and we'll take any win that we can get, you know, uh, when it comes to pushing this forward. Yeah. And as we wrap up this conversation, and thank you so much, I I'm taking mental notes of what both of you have said. As we wrap up today's conversation, I'd like to leave the audience with some tangible steps. What are some quick fire things that they could do to start this journey as both of you have been on it for quite some time? What is one thing you could leave the audience with? Well, if I can start is that I would say, you know, start with yourself. I mean, please, I mean, look in the mirror every day and ask like, you know, what it is that I can, what can I do to make a difference, you know, and what it is that I have done that, you know what, I really shouldn't have. And then it's okay, you know, like don't beat yourself too much for it, but then do something about it and make a change. Yes, definitely start with yourself. Yeah, for me, one of the experiences that has been a shared reality for us all is the heightened need to focus on mental health awareness. And so spotlighting how you can protect your own mental health, give each other the space and grace within our workplaces to do it for themselves, navigate and onboard resources like Lyra, for example, to be part of that practice with you. Because by focusing on and obsessing our own mental health, it, it leaves a pathway for empathy to enter so that as we're navigating some of these more complex conversations, we can do so from a vantage point of a deeply shared experience that we've all undergone the last two years. 
Well, Olivia and Jarvis, thank you so much for your time. I think the message is loud and clear. Start at home, start with yourself. We all are empowered to do, do the work and make change. Thank you so much for your time today and what a wonderful discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us.